So this evening, we're going to take a few moments to examine a subject that is of special importance to us as Christians, and that being the establishment of the Lord's Church. So really, why is this topic important to understand or really to be knowledgeable of? Well, first, I think that a better understanding of the establishment of the Lord's Church, especially from a historical or chronological viewpoint, gives us a better, a better perspective of what the early church would have been like when it was first established. I.e., what sort of activities uh, was the church doing whenever it first came into the world? What was the world like at the time? Also, a proper understanding of the establishment of the church will, by necessity, allow us to distinguish the legitimate church of the New Testament from the many churches that are around today. In other words, a proper understanding provides us with a great sense of identity. Also, based on when the church was established uh, and based on who it was established by, we can obtain a better understanding of the laws that govern the church, as kind of already alluded to. Also, really kind of gives us a perspective for the rest of the meeting. Uh, you can't understand the name of the church or the organization of the church or uh, the falling away or these restoration principles unless you first have a grounding in the establishment of the church in the first place. So in regards to the foundation, I think the best place to start is looking at uh, when it was established, and from that it will give us a much better idea of who established it. So if the church of the New Testament was established thousands of years ago, its founder can't be someone who lived hundreds of years ago, and vice versa. So we'll first take a look at three common beliefs or positions of when the church was established. The first being that the church was established in the days of Abraham, as some would believe. So really, this belief stems from Acts chapter 7, verse 38. You're welcome to turn there in your Bibles if you want to follow along. And really, starting in verse 37, it says, This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Starting in verse 38. This is he who is in the congregation, so the King James Bible says church, in the wilderness with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai. And with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us. Because of the use of the word church here in this passage, uh, some have come to the belief that the church of God has existed since the days of Abraham. However, this belief is faulty for several reasons. First off, the word church in this passage uh, is the Greek word ekklesia, one that most everyone here is probably familiar with, uh, which literally means called out. Just like the Jews, or sorry, it, car it carries the idea of separation or being set apart for a given purpose. Just like the Jews during the wilderness wanderings were set apart from the rest of the world at that time. They were called out, just like Christians today are the called out of the world. They were to be separate and apart from the world just as we are. However, the use of the term church or congregation in the book of Acts does not make the connection between the people of that time and the church of the New Testament. Secondly, this view uh, of the church being established in Abraham's day is faulty because prophecies of the Old Testament and prophecies that came after uh, the wilderness wonders, for that matter, reveal that the church was yet to be established and would come to fruition sometime in the future. So the first prophecy we look at, and we'll try and go very quickly, is that of Daniel's prophecy in Daniel chapter 2. So, and you're welcome to turn there. So in this rather iconic moment, uh, Daniel volunteers to explain the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. As you likely know, the king has thus far been unable to understand his troubling dream, whether by his own power or by the help of the magicians, astrologers, sorcerers, or Chaldeans, as you see in verse 2. So long story short, Daniel ends up volunteering in verse 24, uh, and he correctly explains the dream of the great image who had a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and feet of iron and clay. In verse 44 we read, And then in the days of these kings, so these kings are talking about the Roman Empire, uh, here as the Romans are represented by the feet of iron and clay, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and all the kingdoms and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. So which kingdom is Daniel referencing here? Well, that would be the kingdom of God, a phrase used interchangeably with the church of the New Testament. And what does this verse say about the timing of the kingdom of God? So when would it be established? It would be established in the days of these kings. The Roman Empire was formally established in 27 BC when Octavian assumed the title of Augustus, thus becoming the first emperor of Rome. 
Therefore, the kingdom of God couldn't come into the world until after this date. Consequently, the New Testament begins its stories or begins its uh, viewpoint, really, in the, in the days of the Roman Empire, as seen in Matthew chapter 3 and Luke chapter 3 as well. Uh, but we'll go ahead and move on to the second prophecy of the establishment of the Lord's church, which is over in Isaiah. So in Isaiah chapter 2, we read about a prophecy that discusses the future establishment. So read with me starting in verse 1 through 3. If you've got your Bibles there, please turn along. Uh, we'll be going back here a little bit tonight. But it says there, the word that Isaiah, that Isaiah the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come, and let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, Paul clarifies what the phrase house of God means. He says there, But if I am delayed, I write to you so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Therefore, the house of God equals the church of God's design. With that in mind, we can understand that the church would be established in the last days, as mentioned in verse 2. Now, when were these last days? It's the key question. Hebrews 1, verse 1 through 2, provides us with the answer. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has anointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds. Now, using this connection, we can understand that the last days are in reference to the time during or near the life of Jesus. This prophecy also gives us four other identifiers, of the, uh, or really of the characteristics of the establishment of the church. So first, it would begin at Jerusalem. Second, all nations would be a part of it. Third, they would be taught his word. And four, they would walk in his path. So with those elements in mind, you may have an idea of where we're going, but we'll continue on nonetheless. So I've also read uh, that some teach and believe that the church was established in the days of John the Baptist, uh, which will be our second position this afternoon. So people arrived at this conclusion largely uh, from Luke chapter 16, verse 16, where it says, The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached, and everyone is pressing into it. So does this mean that the church was established by and or in the days of John? I disagree for the following reasons. First, I don't believe that this passage teaches that the kingdom, uh, which is synonymous with the church, of course, of God was already established. Consider J.W. McCarthy's take on this passage. He says there, uh, the gates of Christ's kingdom were not opened until blank. I can't spoil the rest of the sermon for you. But men, hearing it was about to be opened, sought to enter it prematurely, not by the gates which God would open, but as such breaches as they themselves sought to make in its walls. So really, to put it another way, the idea here is that until John, the law and the prophets were the concepts being taught to God's people. However, once John started teaching and preaching, this changed. John began to teach about a new, better concept that would soon take place, that being the coming of Christ and his kingdom, and he was the first to do so. When he taught these new concepts, people naturally wanted in and wanted to be part of it to the point where they were pressing into it. The King James Version actually says violently entering or enters violently into it, uh, even though the way in had not yet come to fruition. Secondly, I disagree with this position because of the overwhelming amount of evidence or scripture that says otherwise. So consider the following, Matthew 3, verse 1 through 3. We'll be spouting out some passages here if you want to follow along. It says, And in those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Matthew 11, verse 11. Assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there is not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. John 3, verse 30. He, this is talking about Jesus, and this is John speaking, must increase, but I must decrease. If John established a church, then it was a church that would, by the verse above, by necessity, decrease with John being the chief witness. Also consider Matthew 16, verse 18. 
rather famous passage, passage there. And it says, And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will, keyword will, build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. This statement by Christ rather simply explains that the church wasn't already established by John or in the days of Abraham or even in the days of Christ's life, rather that it was coming in the future. You can also look at Hebrews 9, 16 through 17, and Matthew 23, verse 1, uh, as well as other passages that prove uh, that the church was established during Christ's personal ministry. So if the church in the New Testament was established in the days of Abraham, John the Baptist, or even during the personal ministry of Jesus, when was it established? This, of course, brings us to the third and final belief on the timing of the foundation, that being that the church was established on the day of Pentecost. Turn over with me to Acts 2. I should certainly turn there, so we'll be spending some time there. Turn over with me to Acts 2, starting in verse 1. We read there that when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. In verse 4, we read that the Holy Spirit comes down, and it gave them utterance to speak in tongues. In verse 5, we see that there were Jews of all nations assembled in Jerusalem at that time. In verse 6, they each heard the words being spoken in their own language and were quite amazed. In verse 14, Peter begins his sermon, and by the end of the chapter, verses 37 and 38, the multitude is cut to the heart and seeks guidance as to what they should do next, uh, which leads to Peter's words in verse 38, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And by the chapter's close, we see that the Lord was adding to the church daily those who were being saved. It's clear that by the close of the chapter, the church is up and running, as really evidenced by the language you see in verse 47, uh, as well as also the fact that the term church is used from that point forward in the New Testament to describe the body of believers. But how do we know that the church was established on the day of Pentecost? So first, think back to the prophecy of Isaiah. So in that prophecy, several traits were listed as to what the establishment of the church would look like. First, it would begin at Jerusalem. Second, all nations would be a part of it. Third, they would be taught his word. And four, walk in his past. Did this event in Acts 2 take place in Jerusalem? Yes, as evidenced by verse 5. Were all nations a part of this event? Yes, as evidenced again by verse 5. Were these nations taught his word? Yes, as evidenced by Peter's gospel sermon, verses 14 to 40. Did the nations who heard the word ultimately end up walking in his past? Yes, as evidenced by verse 41, 42, 44, 45, 46, and 47. So clearly this event in Acts 2 met all the characteristics the prophet Isaiah listed all those years prior. Second, also consider Jesus' instruction before his ascension into heaven. Luke 24, verse 46 and 49, or through 49. Then he said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. What happened on the day of Pentecost? First, repentance and remission of sins was preached in his name to all the nations. Second, it began at Jerusalem. And third, they were endued with power from on high, from the Holy Spirit. Also, consider the following, Acts chapter 11, verse 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell upon them as upon us at the beginning. On top of all that, as I already mentioned, uh, after Pentecost, the church, of, uh, the church of God is always, or the Church of Christ, excuse me, is always spoken of as in existence, uh, as you see in Acts 2, 47, 5, or 11, or 5 verse 11, as well as several other verses. So all these things considered, I think it's plainly clear that the church was established on the day of Pentecost. So the church was established then, we're left with one question, who established it? So based on what we've studied so far, I think the answer is clear and doesn't really require that much explanation. The apostles established the church with the Holy Spirit giving them aid and direction, and they did so through Christ's authority and through the groundwork which he had already laid. The framework of the church was brought about by Christ and his teaching uh, oh, excuse me, the framework of the church was brought about by Christ and his life, death, and resurrection and the apostles on the day of Pentecost through their teaching built on top of it to form the glorious institution known as Christ's church. Christ was the architect and the apostles were simply the builders and on the day of Pentecost the church of Christ was built 
and it will continue to stand as long as the earth does. Think back to Isaiah's prophecy. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed, and the kingdom shall not be left to other people. It shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. What a glorious opportunity and blessing we have to be members of the same church that was foretold in prophecy all those years ago. What a blessing it is to be members of the church of Christ, or the church that Christ bought through his shed blood. How awesome is it that we can understand the mystery of Christ, something that was not made known to men for thousands of years, but has now, under the New Testament dispensation, made itself known to us through the Holy Spirit and his word. I leave you with, the, with this very passage, Ephesians 3, verses 1 through 7. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge of the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the Gentile, or was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the, by the Spirit to his apostles and to the prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. Thank you.